I'm sure this has happened to you. You do the research for your next video. You start planning out a script. You set up the equipment to begin recording on a Monday. And then over the weekend, you wake up and find that CBS Sunday Morning has profiled the same damn artist you were going to talk about. Well, you know what? CBS did kind of a fluff piece on Ed Ruscha, and we're not about that here. So let's get into it. Art lovers, welcome back to the channel. My name is Christopher West, and this is a place where we can talk about modern and contemporary art and design. And yes, the world is all abuzz about Ed Ruscha right now. He's currently the subject of a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. His auction prices have been going crazy. And he just seems to be, all in all, a pretty great guy. I remember seeing his paintings early on in my art career, and at first I thought they were a gimmick. No way would they stand up to art history. But then I started working my first job out of college at a gallery in San Francisco, and the art preparators there hung a piece by Ruscha very close to my desk. And over the weeks as I lived with it, I began to realize these were much more than sign paintings, and these were no gimmick. Ed Ruscha could paint. These weren't just paintings made by a mere mortal. They were painted with incredible skill. It was at that moment that I realized Ruscha had taken the same amount of care to paint his paintings as an old master might paint a history painting. And all of a sudden, my eyes were wide open to what art could be. But why does he paint what he paints? For this, I think we need to go back a little bit. Ruscha, like me, had a fascination with California. Just as I felt pulled to leave Indiana and head west, Ruscha too felt pulled to leave Oklahoma and set out for the Golden State. The sunsets, the glamorous aspects of things, sunshine, speedy cars. He settled in Southern California and started taking courses in lettering, design, and advertising at the Chunard, Chun, Chun, I have no idea how to say that word. But it was while studying design at, that he saw a work by a young Jasper Johns, Target with Four Faces from 1955. He says when he saw this piece, it was like an atomic bomb went off on his training. So he began to paint, but the early work wasn't always well received. He had a painting that he hung on the walls of, and that painting so enraged a faculty member that he burned it. So Ruscha supported himself by becoming a sign painter and a typesetter. He did end up graduating from, and took a job at an ad agency, but quit after a few months. It was on a trip to Europe with his mother and his brother that his eyes would be open to the possibilities of him being an artist. He became fascinated by the street and shop signs in France and began to paint them. He didn't always know what the words meant, but the shape of the words, the typography, was what thrilled the graphic designer within him. And he realized that America, and in particular the American West, was a landscape of signs. Ruscha once said, I like the idea of a word becoming a picture, almost leaving its body, then coming back and becoming a word again. Words typically take a secondary role in the history of art. You have the picture, then you have the text about that picture. Ruscha places language at the center. And there was something else happening in the art world at this time, particularly around Europe and New York City. Pop art. And although Ruscha resisted being labeled a pop artist, his work seemed to fit in nicely with this new art movement. And it wouldn't take long for his uniquely American style, dare I say uniquely California style, to catch on in the broader art world. He was included in the exhibition New Painting of Common Objects, the first museum survey of American pop art held in the United States at the Pasadena Art Museum in 1962. But the place to be in LA as an artist in the early 60s was the Ferris Gallery, where he would have his first solo show in 1963. His fame increased, but he still remained close with his family. He would travel Route 66 often to go visit them back in Oklahoma. It was on one of these trips where he was inspired to make his first of 16 photo books, 26 Gasoline Stations, now considered one of the most important artist books in history. And why did he choose Gasoline Stations? And more specifically, why did he choose 26 gasoline stations? The title came before I even thought of the pictures. I like the word gasoline, and I like the specific quality of 26. And although he often explored photography, he never considered it an end product. 
it was a tool used to make his books or as source material for his paintings. And we see how 26 gas stations would become the inspiration for later paintings and prints. And when he got tired of paint, he would experiment with other materials. This piece was made using gunpowder. And this one made of his own blood. Here is a print he made with cheese as the subject matter. And here's a painting of cheese made with gunpowder and pastel. And here's a piece he literally incorporated actual cheese to act as a pigment. I love his paintings of the mundane, highlighting things we often pay no attention to. But it's the word paintings that we always come back to for Rouge. And the words he uses come from a variety of sources. Books, movies, popular culture, or even just from conversations he is having throughout his day. Rouget's paintings of the 1960s explore the noise and the fluidity of language. With works such as Oof, which presents the exclamation in yellow block letters on a blue ground, it is nearly impossible to look at the painting without verbalizing the visual. And Rouget has been forever loyal to his adopted hometown of Los Angeles. As the city evolved, so too did his work. The iconic Hollywood sign, the movie houses, inspiration from film, and his landscapes continue to evolve too. His metro plots are aerial views of metropolitan areas defined by intersecting parallel lines of the grid system or by the actual names of the Los Angeles streets and avenues. Around the same time as he began to make his metro plots, Rouchet was also using found images unrelated to LA, bold and colorful mountain ranges. His mountains don't represent specific mountains, rather the idea of mountains. And the text that sound like advertising slogans or titles from newspapers seems at odds with the landscapes making the meaning of these works elusive and mysterious. And have we talked about fires? This too is a recurring theme in Rouchet's work. Rouchet has set restaurants on fire, gas stations on fire, even museums on fire. Is Rouchet making a social statement, a political statement, or just having a little laugh? He never answers those questions. Actually, he never even asks those questions. It's left up to the viewer. Rouchet has always shown his work at important galleries, like the Ferris and the Irving Bloom Galleries in Los Angeles and the Leo Castelli Gallery in New York. He would have his first exhibition at Gagosian Gallery in 1993, and his relationship with Gagosian continues to this day. After decades of working in 2004, he would have the first retrospective of his drawings at the Whitney Museum of Art. And the culmination of his career is happening now at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Nearly 200 works of art, spanning over six decades of art making. Jackson Arne in The New Yorker wrote, if you think you hate conceptual art, see this show. Chances are you hate bad conceptual art. And if you can't tell, that's a little Ed Ruscha over my right shoulder there. I've been fortunate enough to have a few pass through my hands over the years. In a case of very strange timing, I bought and sold this one from 2001 during the pandemic. If you're wondering about the market for Ruscha's work, well, it's strong, with his early work from the 60s performing the best. This work here from 1964 sold for more than $50 million. And this piece here, also from 1964, sold just last week for nearly $40 million. But part of the beauty of the art market is that if you love an artist but can't drop $40 million on a painting, prints and multiples are often available for a tiny fraction of the cost. I've got a few available now on my website, so if that interests you at all, I'll put a link in the description below. And that's all I've got for you today, folks. It means so much that you've come back to watch. And if you like Ruscha's work, if you like American painting, I'll put a link to the video I did on Robert Colescott right here. I think you'll find him pretty fascinating too. And if you have a minute, please take a moment to subscribe to this channel and let me know what you think about Ed Ruscha's work down in the comments below. It sure means a lot. So thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you again on the next one. Ciao.